Welcome to another G4 Guitar Business Show. My name is David Hart. Today I've got a very special guest from the United States, Steve Freeman. Anyone who knows of Steve knows that he's been in the industry for a long, long time. In fact, that he, he as long as I've been around, he's he's been there. He's been doing stuff. When I was a kid in school, Steve was. Uh, out there making a name for himself um, and, and I've, there's quite a resume here so I'm going to do it very quickly very briefly so we can get straight yeah, to, to, to talking um, about Steve and his, his current situation and history. Um, Steve basically has been in the business for 35 years. Uh, he studied originally at Berkeley College before becoming an instructor at the Music Institute in California. Um, so that kind of says it all. He, he's, he's worked with people like Don Mock, Scott Henderson, Steve Tirado, Tommy Tedesco, uh, and Robin Ford, just to name a few. Uh, he's, he then later in 1985, I'm going back a fair way now, he, he founded the Atlanta Institute of Music, a nationally accredited school for guitar and bass and drums. Uh, as a founder and president of the institute, he taught and managed an excellent staff and facility. So what we're talking about here is not just a guy who is a guitarist, but but an educator and a, a, an entrepreneur, a manager. So he's he's got a, a world of skills here and I'm, I'm, uh, an hour is not going to do him justice, but we'll make the most of it. Um, Steve, thanks for joining me. Hey, man. Thank you for asking. I really appreciate it. Really do. It's it's, so, so let me, I just want to jump in here quickly. How did it come about that you ended up at the Music Institute? Okay, you, you're at Berkeley, but how did that come about for you? Oh, well, actually, I was at Berkeley and um, wanted to go to warmer weather. <laughs> <laughs> good no, good Ber reason. Berkeley, I don't know. I, I, you know. I came from, I was born in Tennessee, and I went to, you know, directly to Back Bay, Boston, where it was kind of a crazy area and so the whole environment for me just wasn't really you know good you know so I, I stuck it out for a couple of years but then I said you know I, I, I remember looking at a guitar player magazine and I saw uh, Larry Carlton or someone was in there they were talking about you know music what that time is called Guitar Institute Technology and so I said man that sounds great and hey that's there's nice uh, it's nice weather and swimming pools and stuff so I'll go there you know so I made this the switch so I actually went there for a year and then I was asked to teach there you know uh, upon graduation fantastic so so let's go right back you and I'm sort of interested to see what got you started you, so you're from Tennessee originally and if I'm right that's Elvis country is that Memphis Tennessee <laughs> is that where he came from <laughs> Tennessee Being a it's more Australian, that's about all I know it's more like Conway Twitty kind of area, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's country music, definitely, you know, is that's the main influence in that area, especially at that time. There wasn't much other than that in the clubs and things. Uh, so, you know, right. a few more. And, and so what, what got you started? How old were you when you first picked up a guitar? My sister had a guitar I remember seeing in the closet and uh, I was about eight years old and she listened to a lot of Beatles and I loved that sound and you know I, I think I really started because I knew that she quit and I didn't I wanted to do something that she quit and do better than her right? <laughs> yes a bit of sibling rivalry yes I, I didn't know, know what I was getting into when I actually made that decision uh, but uh, anyway she uh, she's the, the reason I started I think really uh, but listening to the Beatles and uh, other music around that time, you know, Otis Redding, I loved Otis Redding, I loved the Motown, all that stuff, you know. I just uh, really liked listening to music and so uh, started picking it up and having fun with it and strings were about, you know, that far off the fretboard, so I was a little frustrated. But Yes, I, yeah. I had a guitar teacher for a little while uh, and he really, really helped me out and uh, what I really enjoyed about him is he pushed me towards the the improvisation side about listening and hearing really early. I was working out of the Mel Bay books and things like that, but he got me, I remember when I played my first little scale to him playing a background, just jam track, you know, and I just, I lit up inside. I knew this is cool. You know, I want to do this. You know? So you know, I, ever since then, man, I just, I got the fire and, and guitar kind of took over and, uh, in some ways, that's been great. In some ways, it's not been so good. But, <laughs> but it's yeah, it's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? We exactly. we um you know we love the music, but um I, I think as a career choice, uh, sometimes it's it's not you know the most financial or the most lucrative. But um you've what you've managed to do, obviously, 
And, and to, to be fair, the, you know, a lot of guitarists and a lot of musicians uh, have they struggle with 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 uh, coming up with a career. So that's kind of what I want to dig into is how you manage to kind of hustle your way into uh, having such a you know a, a great career uh, where you know many are, are left trying to find uh, alternatives. So it's, if I go back to my early years, I, I remember you know working in retail and um, having to do these kind of odd jobs. Did you? Is there was there a period where you struggled to get work, or are there have there been periods? Are there anything in your history that you can well, remember? There like was, that? There was a time between. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I really went into music pretty quick. I mean, because that, when I when I was at Musicians Institute and got hired, I was I basically got hired to start a thing called. They had a summer session there, and I started working on that. And it was a minimum time, you know. So it, times were tough financially for sure. But I always knew what I wanted to do, uh, and I always had an extreme passion and, and a drive that just would not stop. And I still feel that way. I mean, that's I think uh, you know, again, that's that's good in some ways. <laughs> it's bad in some ways. But I have that. I have a focus that if I want to do something, I'm going to do it, and uh, and that's what I really did. And there, I'm saying it was tough sometimes. I mean, trying to to get uh, work, to get students, to uh, you know, just to to keep surviving as a musician but at that time you've got to understand too music was thriving pretty pretty much people there were tons of people wanting to play guitar Berkeley was full all these music schools were booming and it was a great time to be in, in music you know so yeah. I was very lucky you know during that during that time too because it, it really did peak I mean you given your kind of age and and when you sort of came into teaching and so forth yeah the, the 80s the 90s uh, right. There was definitely a huge boom in in everybody. You know, I, from here from Australia, uh, you know, the thing for us was to get to to the institute or get to Berkeley. That was you know that was the dream of, um, and and as I think we spoke earlier, uh, Frank Gambale, Australian guitarist, he ended up there as well, and you guys became friends as far as as far as I know. Is that correct? Oh yeah, yes. I've yep. done Frank ever since. Oh my goodness, since probably nineteen eighty two. Yep. Yep. Yeah, for a long time. So it's it's been yeah, and, and just on that point, I remember an interview with uh, Steve Lukather, um, who's you know one of my uh, favorite guitar players. Um, you probably know him, I'm sure. Um, no, so, actually, I don't. Know, but I'd like to. So if he ever hears this, please call me. Give give you a call. Yes, it's time for the Steves to get together. <laughs> you could have a Steve guitar fest. There you go. There's a there's a few oh, around. Um, so, but yeah, I remember in the interview, and they said to him, they asked him, "What would you do if you weren't uh, playing guitar?" And he, and he kind of smiled and he said, "Would you like fries with that, sir?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that. That, in, in other words, I don't know anything else. I don't do anything else. Um, if if I'm not going to get paid playing guitar, I'll probably be working at McDonald's or um, you know doing it pretty tough. So yeah, so I, I think something that I would take away there from you is that there was a real commitment. To your your music, which I can relate to, because I, I, you know, after leaving school, you know, when I was at school, most of my friends went off to university, uh, whereas I went off and played in a band, and and I really didn't think of any other alternative other than doing music in one way, shape, or form. So yeah, I totally relate. It's so it's like, hey, uh, oh, what do you do for your real job? You play music, but what do you do for your real job? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, when are you gonna? Yeah, when are you going to get a real job? When are you going to get a career and start something? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, if we go back to just again rolling back a little bit with your first teacher, what are some of the things, the takeaways that you got from your teacher as far as you know, inspiration or, or mentoring as a teacher, not not as a student, but things that you sort of say, well, I really like the way my teacher did that, and that's something that I'm going to carry on into my own teaching. You know, I, again, I think it's the the use of, of the ear, uh, listening, uh, transcribing. Um, I've always pushed ear training on I mean, most of my students that will listen to me. <laughs> but the ear training aspect of it, I mean, Alan Laverne was his name. He was a great, great player, and uh, he he was out playing gigs. He was on the radio. I mean, so he was a good kind of mentor, first teacher to have. You know, he kind of fit where he was a player, he was a teacher, I could tell he was an educator. And um, so I think that's, he really started it off off for me. He worked at a yeah. place called Music Center in Johnson City, Tennessee. And uh, I don't know what he's doing now, but Alan, if you hear me, awesome, great, I love you, call me sometime. 
Look me up. Well, yeah, it's, it, 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 I, I can relate to that. And I think the, the ear is a big thing because, uh, you know, we kind of have a, a saying where, you know, ear, ear before eye. Uh, so, yeah, learning to read music, learning those skills are very important. But um, I think, you know, ultimately the ear is where it needs to start. And, and I've noticed that with, with uh, you know, some of the better players that I've come across over the years is that they, some of them aren't the greatest readers. Some of them aren't, you know, they lack theory. They lack a lot of areas, but they have incredible ear. Uh, you know, so they can they can hear something and they can work it out and play it. So yeah, it's. I think the the other the, there's a method which inspired part of what we do, G4 guitar method. Part of the inspiration for that came from Suzuki. And if you know anything about the Suzuki method, yeah, it's all about ear training early on. Exactly. I mean, Alan, I, I, you know, you run into a brick wall too with the ear, though, if you're not doing the reading and you're not <laughs> working on the harmony and exactly what you what you're doing which is awesome is you're you're putting a, a method out there that you know really tells young players hey this is what you need to do to be to really be successful you don't want to be successful one thing and then run in and, and run through all these you know these hard times of trying to play with somebody that you really can't you can't read a chart or you can't do that i mean it's it's really important to to you know not go through the whole learning period with blinders on and thinking, hey, I'm just going to do one thing. So uh, hats off to you, man. I just wanted to say that too, because I mean, what you're doing is great. I, I really, really think that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes from inspiration from professional players because uh, I think there's a bit of a myth in the music industry that, that, you know, successful guitar players are rock stars when in fact most guitar playing is done by non rock stars, if you like. Um, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the majority of the work. They're not rock stars. There's a few rock stars, um, but the rest of them are, are, you know, are playing gigs, reading charts, playing sessions, studio work, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, or educators. Yeah, educators. So, so from the point of view of a, because I want to kind of dig in a little bit into your business side of things as well. Yeah. In in terms of when you when would you say you started your first business? Was that Atlanta as as a business yeah. rather than being a manager, so to speak? Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I was always uh, an instructor, you know, always an instructor or playing in a band, and uh, I loved teaching so much. And Don Mock, a, a incredible player, one of my uh, the best mentor I think I've ever had uh, as far as, as music goes. He uh, you know, the way he taught and I just had that I just wanted to teach and uh, at that time actually my mom also was, was sick she had cancer and I was trying to get back closer and MI uh, had approached me Pat Hicks and said hey uh, you know we could do this as a, a prep school to go to Musicians Institute and so I went in into that as a prep school my school started as a prep school for maybe three months and then I broke away from them shortly after, after that, just because I could not find uh, uh, students that would come and be able to stay at a three month program, getting leases for apartments, all that kind of thing. So I had to, I, kind of just, I, I was out in the ocean without a paddle and I had to make it work. <laughs> so that, that was my, that was exactly my business training is, hey, here you are, uh, make it happen. And it's like, oh my God. It's a kind and of single, single swim, right? 25 years old so uh you know yep you can do amazing things at 25 that you, that you can't do at 58 so well yeah and and it actually in it's i've come from sort of you know reading about mentors because i read a lot of business books and um, you know you bill gates and you uh, you know you steve jobs and all these kind of guys um right. they often have that message where they talk about you know, when you're young, make lots of mistakes. Go out there and take lots of big risks because you you've got another life. Um, you know, at 25, if you're bankrupt, well, it's your life's not over. Um, you're just starting out. Whereas if you you know you're 50 or or whatever, you're bankrupt. It's it can be hard to get back on the horse um, <laughs> later in life. <laughs> so, um, you know, especially if you've got family and you don't want to put everything on on the line. But yeah, you know, when you're 25, you can't do it. I remember reading about uh, what's his name, Fred Smith. I think Fred Smith. Um, from um, FedEx, how he went to Vegas and put it all on the red, because uh, yeah. <laughs> he needed <laughs> <laughs> he needed money to start his FedEx business. And yeah, it's a crazy, stupid thing to do, of course, but um, it yeah, paid off. He actually won. So. I would have only had like twenty five dollars to put on. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> it would have went far. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so when you so, so to go through it, what? How did you actually start the business? Did you did you did you go and rent a studio, or what? What happened? What were the steps? Well, at first, uh, I, I I visited Atlanta. My sister lived uh, here, and so I visited, and it was a hundred degrees of humidity when I got out of the car. I didn't know for sure I wanted to live here, but I started hitting this, just walking around and uh, actually ran into someone that had a, uh, a business there called Mega Music. And uh, a friend, a guy named Charlie Miller, told me about this place in, in Atlanta. And so I, I just I reached out to them and said, hey, I want to start this, this school. And so they said, OK, well, we've got this space in the back. And I go in the back and I look. And this was a 25,000 square foot music store, which you never hear of today, right? Would have, but it was full of nothing but, you know, lower lower end instruments, which I didn't understand. But the back was full of just kind of garbage and trash. But it was like like offices and rooms, and so they gave me uh, eight months there to just to kick it off, and that and that's uh, that's what I did. Wow. My so, wife was part of this as well, and she was on the administrative side that stood by my side for many years, and finally said, "I'm done." <laughs> I'm out of here. Yep. <laughs> well, well it, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because what you're talking about there, and it's an example that I give to to a lot of teachers starting out, is if you can find someone to kind of partner with, uh, yes. in one way, shape, or form, which is what you did, right? You, you you've of gone. Course. Yep. And and so that's allowed you to get a free rent period and 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 get on your feet. Exactly. I mean, there were certain situations that I maybe have to pay for because the security thing wasn't so secure. So we maybe have to have somebody come in and watch over while we had classes, that kind of thing. But I mean, it was it was a great opportunity to uh, have a name. Um, we, we, we couldn't call it Musicians Institute. We couldn't. We started out. I think it was called Guitar Video Workshops or something non-related. It sounded really stupid, and you know, today it sounds archaic. You know, video, but. Uh, then I think we, we we changed the name and it was uh, uh, Atlanta Institute of Music. I think started we called it that back in 80, 88 or eighty nine something like that. I changed it, but uh, but yeah, yeah it, it, it's de delving into the business aspect of it. You know, just uh, we, it basically just came from having to do it, and so I was just thrown in there. But if you can find anybody that's willing to partner, and you can see. Uh, you know your business or someone else's business flourishing, and, and there's some type of uh, camaraderie there, and have the same vision. I think it's very important to do that. I think it's not only you do, you do, by doing that, you also build relationships that last for a lifetime. You know, and that's what I at MI going back, and I'm sure you you know you, your uh, acquaintances and people that you've worked with in the past. But I mean, at MI, I still take still touch stay in touch with most of those guys. Scott Henderson was just here like a, a couple months ago and doing a show, you know, and we we stay in contact. Uh, Doug Perkins has Jazz Guitar Society. We still, you know, are good friends. And I mean, everybody on my Facebook, we're always in contact with like we never, and the same way with even the guys that mega music, there's some people from there that when I started the business, I still stay in contact with. And yeah. uh, even the guys I'm working for right now, uh, I was in contact with, so many, many, many years ago, that uh, it's just those relationships that you build and and you and trust, you know, between people that uh, that can be that job job you're looking for when nothing's around, and you and uh, you know you you got to keep your eyes open. I think it's really important, especially now. But, uh, yeah, it's really yeah. I, I think it's that kind of almost that six degrees of separation, isn't it? Is that you, you know, if you, you look at Hollywood as an example, and um, you know, I've read a bit about this, is that most of the jobs, the acting jobs in Hollywood, come through not what you know, but who you know. They're they're, yeah. they're connected, and and it's the same in the music industry. Uh, you know, it, you've you've got a you've got a bit of a certain standard to get a certain job. They're not going to give you a session guitar job with you know a, a really important. Uh, musicians or, or etc at a standard if you're still trying to work out what a C chord is um, right. but, <laughs> no. but but there is a uh, th there is this kind of but but I think it also raises you right as you you know going to Berkeley uh, if I'm correct would have kind of lifted you up you would have started to see the standard that was there and you knew okay well I need to be at this standard so you, you, you work harder right yeah I mean you I mean I remember practicing we had proctors on each floor and at that time they would not let you practice in your rooms you had to practice in practice rooms which had no uh, you know 
soundproofing whatsoever. Because so I could be beside a sax player or a drummer. And so uh, I said, hey, I'm going to, I figured it out. I'm going to take a pillow. And I'm going to go into the bathroom, put it on the actually toilet, and I'm going to practice in there. <laughs> But then it, started, then it started getting to where we just kind of started mocking it because we were all so mad. I just, then I started having bands in my room and we'd get them all. They really stirred things up a bit. But uh, yeah, you have to, uh, I mean, the practice part of it, I always put in the time and uh, kind of overdid it a lot. Sometimes I still I have some, some hand problems now, but I, th don't th I think they're more hereditary than they are from practicing. But uh, yeah, I would practice eight, 10 hours a day sometimes. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Her, but I still, <laughs> but I practice ten hours a day. But yeah, that's, that's you have to be you have to be willing to work, especially as a, to get better at an instrument. Well, no matter what instrument it is, to know uh, what you need to work on. Number one, and you have to be uh, also have a good you know someone to to cheer you on to give you confidence. And I think uh, the performance aspect of that at a school uh, or, or even if it's a school like I'm, I'm involved with this place here in Atlanta called Atlanta Music. Uh, it's called the Red Music. <laughs> can't even think. Red Club Music Foundry. Uh, and uh, they have a, it's a school downstairs, a performance theater upstairs. A guy, Eddie Owen, uh, runs it who founded like uh, a, lot, a lot like John Mayer and uh, a lot, lots of players. So I mean, he's so I have a great situation here to and um, to be around musicians and kind of see this next generation of people, you know, coming up. But yeah, yeah, it, it, it and, and I, I want to make sure that that everyone watching gets that point about uh, networking and that the fact that you're keeping connected with people in the industry and knowing that you know everybody's in, in different places. Sometimes you could. You know, some kid could come up to you and say, "Hey, Steve, uh, you know, I really like what you're doing," and, and it's very easy for you to go, "Yeah, kid, I'm busy now. I've got to, you know, got to go somewhere." But taking the time to sort of say, "Well, here's a kid who's excited about what they're doing," acknowledging them and giving giving something to them that can come back two years later when you find out that this guy is, um, you know, a, a big player in the industry. About teaching, what you bring up a good point is that uh, I find a lot of teachers that just come out of a school like that, uh, any kind of a school that you know they're young and they're. It's when, especially when I was coming up, it was all the the metal stuff and it was all the you know sweet picking all the stuff. And so a lot of people come out as as a, a fresh uh, graduate, and they don't. I mean, they 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 kind of. I don't know. I don't want to say they're arrogant, but I, I have to say sometimes they don't. They feel it's beneath them to teach you know, beginners or, or this kind of stuff. And, and that, I mean, that's the biggest thing is you're never good enough to, I mean, you're, you're never too you're, good, right? Yeah. You're never too good to teach. I can tell you that because I'm, I'm not saying I'm good, but you can't ever be too good to show, uh, show somebody how to play. I mean, if you, if you're gifted enough and work hard enough, you want to see somebody else have that same, you know, fire and desire to play. And if they actually come up to you and ask you, I saw Scott Henderson uh, play with Jean-Luc Pawnee and some kid comes up to him. I was, was talking with Scott and, and his parents and it just came up, kind of interrupted the conversation. Scott didn't say, get away. He, he broke away from the conversation he was having with myself and the parents and took the kid to the stage to show him his, his rig and his setup, you know, so. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, wow. That's kind of, you know, it, it and I see that happening because I used to work for a company for many, many, many years uh, or Camp Jam and uh, and hiring uh, teachers all around the country. And that's the biggest thing I had to struggle for is you get, you know, you'd hire people that get in there and they think it's, oh, it's camp. It's like, oh, yeah, this is more, I, I could be doing something better. But that's the thing, you know, so I, everybody needs to realize that coming up, man, you, you that attitude's not going to happen. You know, you've got to you've got to be positive. You've got to work. You've got to connect with people and you've really got to, to you know, be humble and 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 work work with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely agree. And and I think you know the, some of the most memorable players that I've met over the years. You know, we, we were talking about earlier before we came online. George Benson. Um, I was lucky enough to meet him once when he was in Australia. Such a humble, nice guy. Like in, incredibly down to earth and um, no, he wasn't pretentious at all. Uh, and you know, Steve Smith, as I spoke about, uh, you know. 
Gambale, uh, even uh, you know recently a lot of players know Guthrie Govan, who um, nicest guy you, you'll meet. Um, th these guys are all very humble and very uh, happy to talk to, no matter what where you're at. There's none of this kind of you know I'm better than you sort of thing. It's just right. yeah, yeah, they totally relate. So um, Guthrie and how he interacts with with the, everyone is is fantastic. Yeah. He's got a real gift for it, actually, hasn't he? He's, he's, he does, he does. he's just got this ability to um, be just like your best mate. There's no kind of you just straight away, yeah. He's he, he's done a couple of workshops for us in the UK. Um, so yeah, he's and he was. You now we thought we'd have to, you know, Trevor who organised it. Trevor is uh, one of our teachers in the UK who organised it all. I didn't organise it, by the way, and I'll put that on record. Trevor did it all. Um, <laughs> Trevor's from Horsham, G4 Guitar in Horsham. Uh, Trevor's an amazing guy. He's he's very, uh, you know, he's a real action taker. And anyway, he 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 decided he'd just contact Guthrie, and and um, and, it all, and it all happened. And uh, yeah, he said he couldn't believe it. He was just so yeah, sure, sounds good, happy to do it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it, I think being humble and, and knowing that that it's a journey and, and different people on the journey, and it is a small industry when you think about it. Um, you know, the the, okay. the people. That, yeah, you know the people in the industry uh, today that you're in contact with are very much uh, have been around in the industry pretty well for you know 30, 40 years. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, what advice would you give to someone starting out as a you know as a, a, a I'm talking a career type guitarist? So we're, we've got this because a lot of my viewers are guitar teachers who are you know may, some of them may be teaching already, some of them are looking at teaching. Uh, but fr from a business point of view, or even a teaching point of view, what are some what are some tips that you would give them? Um, for for, for you talking about mainly to build their studios, to build their teaching programs, yeah, like, yeah, to build their studio to get started. Well, let, okay, let's break it into two. Okay, so let's just start with their program. What what kind of things would you recommend that they would do in terms of putting a program together? Well, the curriculum, look at all aspects, just exactly what you've done. Uh, look at all aspects of, uh, you know, playing the instrument, divide it up into, uh, I mean, like with the, I started with with a school, so I did, my thing was a little different. You know, I had a quarter of, you know, like scales and technique or a quarter of chords and rhythm, and harmony and theory and sight reading. So I had the luxury, uh, and I admit at that, you know, when you have the luxury of saying, oh, you're only accepting this level of student, and they have to follow this curriculum is completely different than teaching out there, teaching privately now. Uh, yep. so a structured method, uh, you know, like like G4, anything that is is going to really be something that the students can follow, and you can build on that. And I think that if if they um, if they have that structure, and it'll keep, keep returning. And um, I guess also develop a, a real good rapport with with the families. Of, of these kids because I've seen many situations uh, that is, could have been just kids quit and could have been salvaged if, if there was just a relationship there between the guitar teacher or and the student and the families and the interest in telling them you know hey the lesson went great here's what we did you know and be really uh, you know just involved I think that that is you know is probably the best advice I could give because I see that happening and I've seen it happen. I mean, here I've seen it happen at other stores and, when, and I, all the time where you could, yep. God, I can't believe he did that. He said that to that kid or he, or he did. so, you know, you've got a huge responsibility as a teacher. I don't, you, you don't take it lightly. You're not somebody just for somebody for a babysitter, even though some parents think that you are and they will treat you like that, but you can't let them do that. And those are the types of students that, you know, you have to set down the rule. This is what's happening. This is what we're doing. And, you know, my opinion now is that, hey, if they're not that type of student and you're not that type of teacher, then they need to go somewhere else, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, there's plenty of teachers out there. There's zillions of them. And, and uh, people decide to play guitar for many different reasons. And so that's the thing I think is kind of what I find the toughest these days is, uh, you know, why are, why are people picking up the guitar? So uh, are, there's not as many guitar idols out there. There's not the, the, the bands like there used to be. So that kind of is, is a very confusing thing, you know, for me. So I think is getting out there somehow, uh, you know, with, with YouTube, with, uh, with everything else that's, you know, internet that's out there, uh, 
to get your business, to get yourself out there, the personality, get a structured method, set up a, a, a strict billing policy, don't fall into the makeup, uh, you know, just sinkhole, make sure that that's firm, make sure that you know uh, what you're doing there. Um, marketing's changed a lot. I, I put out flyers and it was snail mail. That's how I, I did it. So as far as relating to that, I can't really say that as much, you know, because I came from a different era. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things have changed enormously. Even in what you're saying there, if you look at the, the charts, if you go back to the, the 80s, the 90s, or really any time from, I guess, the 60s through to, you know, the turn of the century, um, mm -hmm. you know, the top 10 songs in the charts were were primarily guitar bands, um, yeah. you know, and, exactly. and, and then it hit 2000 and they disappeared. <laughs> now yeah. you're, you're lucky to find any guitar bands in the, in the, the top 100. Uh, so where, yeah, I think that's a great question is where are these guitarists coming from and why are they wanting to play guitar? So, so what would you say? What, 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 how would you answer that question? Uh, well, actually through the years of, of camp jam and trying to figure out that question, I mean, that was the, the big question is that where are these kids, uh, how do we market to them? How, how do they get, uh, do you market to the parent? You market to the student, you know, and all these different questions that come up. And so, uh, you know, now with just the, the, I know that everybody can't afford uh, targeting banner ads and things like that, you know, but uh, that's where I think the partnership thing comes in. I think that any kind of partnership, anything you can do to get the, get, get it out there, get anything that you're trying to do out there. Uh, but with Camp Jam, it, it was it was different because you had kids that have been playing s maybe six months. Can, can I to just interrupt you one second? Can you tell us what Camp Jam exactly is for anyone who doesn't know? Camp Jam it was, is a summer camp, and it, it was started by uh, Dan Lipson, a business uh, guy that used to have a, a NASCAR catalog, basically, and uh, Jeff Carlisi, who was the guitar player for 38 Special, uh, original songwriter guy. So they got together through a NASCAR outing somewhere, and boom, that's where Camp Jam and how we're here in Atlanta, the whole South, you know, whoo hoo. That's what how that started. But Camp Jam, we we'd bring in rock stars to do uh, you know clinics and master classes, and it was great during that time. But actually, we were more marketing toward the parents because the parents knew who these people were. The kids didn't. They'd recognize the song, but they didn't recognize. The, uh, you know, the, the actual artist. So today trying to relate, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really tough. So I could see that way to market just going, getting slimmer and slimmer. So now, okay, now the grandparents know who they are. <laughs> so now what do you do? You know, what's the next step? You know, what's the next step? So, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, just getting, I mean, if I had like what I'm doing here at the Red Clay Music Foundry, uh, I'm partnering with uh, a guy named here. I mean, I'm not involved with any kind of the, the, the uh, programs per se that go on here, like any kind of things that they do other than I'll help get workshops, you know, plan workshop, bring help them bring in artists. I'll, I teach to privately. That's one thing I've taught privately, no matter what I was doing, continued all my life. I've never stopped. Even if I was on a, you know, six day, camp thing I would come back and I would I would always teach every week so I've never I never let that go yeah but uh so you know so the, being being partnered there we you know I have a lot more power to get my name out to do to do things that I need so I think that's the way that it needs to be uh for anybody starting out especially with the music business is as is you know it's just getting s smaller as far as <laughs> the the music that's on the radio or uh, or you see guitar stores, the mom and pops, you know, around here that there's not so much anymore. And so you see all these changes. So it, it's, it's, it's something that it's kind of like what's happening in the, uh, the White House. You never know what's happening day to day. <laughs> here in the States, yes. music, it's, it's chaos. <laughs> very crazy. And, uh, you just say, what's next? What do we do? You know, how, do, how do we stay on top of this? And so, uh, because you know, there's this, there's this huge shift that's going on. Uh, you know, one of the the other things that I'm quite passionate about is technology and uh, you know the way that the things are moving forward. If we if we look at you know today, 
uh, you know, everyone has a mobile phone. That was unimaginable when we were kids, right? That was something that was like from the Jetsons or, or some kind of futuristic um, idea was to have a little thing that could connect with everyone. So that, that seems today to the kids today, that's just normal. They, they don't see it as anything special at all. Um, and right. so I think what we're going to see is this uh, shift and it's, and it's actually accelerating if you, if you, if you look at it from the point of view of, of technology moving forward. But the, the fact that people would go to a guitar teacher in their, their local suburb and so forth, that's changing now. And that's why you say your ma and pop uh, music store. To me, that is like the, the ma and pa grocery store that's now disappeared um, you know, with supermarkets. Um, so, yeah, that's, going to, that's disappearing and it's disappearing fast. So, so yeah, we, uh, what you're saying is spot on is that we now have to look to, okay, what's the changes that are going on? And if we look at the, the, the fact that major retailers, look at Amazon, they're wiping out retailers left, right and centre because people are buying online. Why do I want to go to a, a retail store where it's, I can't get a park, uh, where the, the person serving me um, is, is rude and, and, you know, all the rest of it? Why do I need all that? Uh, when I can just go and click a button online and, and they deliver it to my door rather than me having to go and find it. So I, I think that, yeah, we're going to see more and more of that. And even though guitar teachers, and that's what I'm finding, don't kind of want to, they, they want to sort of believe that they'll always have plenty of students. Um, I, I think that that's nice, but I don't know how realistic it is. I think that it's going to come to a point where people are just going to virtual reality, guitar in the hand. What's the difference? I can learn from somewhere on the other side of the world, or I can learn from the guy around the corner. It, it's the, the, I think the experience will get to that point pretty soon. Yeah, let, let's hope we can keep that from happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, another ten years. I, I, look, I, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. I think it'll happen. It'll it'll still take a little while. And I actually think that that personal coaching, the the in person coaching, is going to be the last thing to go. I think it'll be right. the very last thing the, the you know things that that are impersonal are always the first um, but yeah that, so um, but yeah I think we're safe for another 10 years Steve in the traditional teaching anyway so well, now, but you, know, you teach on you know teach online you, you know you go to uh, mobile you have mobile you go to homes and teach I mean uh, you go to maybe a school and teach uh, kids so you, you it's definitely become mo more mobile and you've had to branch out and uh, you, you stop being so centralized where you can stay in your studio and, and Jam, it's great that you can get online, and I, I love all the technology, which I um, hope to get to talk about here later, uh, th that I'm doing now. But all the technology um, that's coming out that makes that possible. And just think, years ago, to, to study with a master teacher, you know, if I was like, I want to study with, you know, Larry Carlton or something, it was like, oh, I, never happened, you know. But of course. You know, now there's there's possibilities to do that online. There's possibilities to to study with a lot of people, and so that has brought up a lot of good things. You know, a lot of good things. Uh, but that personal touch is something that you know is is I hate to see leave, but there's got to be some some way. I, I think there's going to be. I don't think it's completely going to go away. I think that. Uh, It'll stay around for a little while, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what what will happen. It's like anything. If you think about the music industry generally, right? Let's go back to to how music was a hundred years ago. There weren't these big rock stars touring the world, playing to massive stadiums, and that's because there wasn't radio. If we go back, you know, even pre radio, um, the, the the musicians of those early days, uh, you know, let's go back to eighteen hundreds. They were just traveling bands um, and they would come to town and play and whatever. And there was some, you know, as as radio came in, then so did the kind of big band and jazz and all that. And the, the, the early stars came out of that. And then when television came, then we got Elvis, the Beatles, um, all of that. Um, and now the internet has come. Uh, we'll see a, a, another change. And and I think what, we, what it's allowing now is, say, music teachers, as with uh, musicians, when radio and TV came in, you had this kind of where more and more people sort of went to one band, you know, you wouldn't have had a Beatles back, you know, 200 years ago. Um, but once TV was there and they could see these guys and, and so you had, you know, millions of kids around the world all into the Beatles. And so now you're going to see these teachers, oh, oh it's already happening, uh, but these teachers who will rise to the top and they will get, you know, the, I'm talking maybe hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of students learning from them, not directly, of course, um, but by online programs. Um, so 
what I want to do, because uh, this is really important, the, the technology that, you, that you're working with at the moment, uh, is when I looked at it, I just thought, wow. And that's, that, that was a lot of the inspiration be, behind me wanting to, to, to interview you here because um, I think it's absolutely groundbreaking. Um, I know there's other guys doing similar things, but when I looked at yours, it was very clean, very slick. Can you tell us about it and, and give, give me some background sure. on it? Number one, it's, it's not mine. <laughs> I just want to get that. Okay, I'm, okay, good. You're not taking, I, yes. I'm a guitar player. I'm not, not the brilliant mathematician and the uh, guy that put the uh, assessment technology together, uh, Margus. Uh, so basically, Margus and Christo are, uh, invented uh, Match My Sound, which is the algorithm to be able to take a, uh, first started as a, uh, just as any sound file and be able to, match, you know, try to match it and actually tell them, you know, give an assessment on the sound file. And so what happened is uh, shortly after that, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dave Smallover, who had the National Guitar Summer Workshops for many years and published 450 probably books with Alfred, uh, came into the picture and uh, started putting, uh, said, well, you gotta, you gotta have the notation part of this. You gotta, you know, be able to, not just the sound part of it, but it's got to be related to actually notated you know, rhythms and, and notes. And so that's how that started working together. And so uh, Dave called me, hey, there's this new thing I'm working on. I'd love to have you involved with it. And so that's how it, you know, it basically started. But what Match My Sound now is, which is in the US that we call it Achieve Music, it is an, it's an algorithm that enables a teacher to stay connected with their student, but have a library of uh, you know, published content on, on their iPad or on their, uh, you know, computer and be able to assign that content to a student who can uh, listen to it, view it, uh, play directly into their uh, microphone on their computer and get an assessment uh, of how um, they play. It would say, you know, they would get so many stars or would say 92% uh, and then it would break that up into tempo and pitch, whatever. But uh, the student can see where the mistakes are and where he is, you know, playing things right. It does not at all take the place of a private music to, you know, teacher. This is a, it's a practice tool. Uh, yep. It's something that a teacher can come back, uh, the student come into the lesson and they can go, hey, awesome, let me hear how you did. But they can actually listen to the student's performance and view the, uh, the uh, assessments that they have. And I'll, uh, I'm a car salesman, so here it is. <laughs> <laughs> You, you promote all you like, Steve. This is, uh, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and 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 I'll just, uh, yeah, for the record, uh, I, I'm not selling this. I have no involvement in this at all. Um, when I saw, I just, I just thought, wow, this is great. Uh, and yeah, I think every every teacher should should definitely get involved with it. Uh, you know, because it's, yeah, it's great. And I was like, wow. So I, you know, I'm sure Dave will be watching this. I want to thank Dave and everybody that has confidence in me to be part of this education team. And uh, this is something that, uh, I mean, I know it's, they, they, they came up with a brilliant technology. I know that uh, being able to, you know, record your own stuff and for a teacher and upload, talking about creating something that is like a curriculum uh, to where you could, uh, you know, have your own curriculum there. And it, it, every student could be assessed on everything that you put in there and have it logged down to see their score, being able to uh, just, uh, see how they're doing, log into their account, know where they're having problems. I mean, I think, you know, I'm thinking back, oh, I had a guitar, I went home and uh, tried to hear something on a 16 turntable to slow it down, scratch. <laughs> I couldn't get in touch with my teacher. They, we didn't have cell phones. You might have, you're not gonna call them at home. And so things like this, there's, there's, you know, keeping in communication with the teacher and the parent, what I like about this can tell if the students are doing the work and it keeps them involved. And uh, it's, it's a really exciting thing. I mean, it's like, uh, it, you know, I, I, I get you know, excited about it every day, actually just thinking about it and hope the hopes that uh, it will catch on really big and people will start using this and we're seeing it already. I can't mention names, but you know, we have other publishers. Now we have Alfred, the entire Alfred uh, and guitar, uh, piano and guitar catalog. All Mel Bay is going to be on there. We have other publishers coming on board, but we're going to have artists and any, you know, people putting in their own content. I have a little folder on there now that I'm starting to add things. It's all public domain. It's a uh, uh, subscription service. So if students decide, uh, uh, their teacher sends them an invite, students can choose, uh, or actually, let me say this, 
the teacher chooses what content would be more appropriate if the if their teacher is going to be uploading uh, their own curriculum, then it's like a $2.95 per month per, uh, subscription service to, to use that content and get critiqued on that, assessed on it. To have the uh, full catalog of all the published uh, content, it's $4.95 a month. And they can just stop it any time that they want, but it's that constant communication. They can log down from months, years of lessons, and it'll all be there and see their progress. So. Fantastic, fantastic. Because there's a, a guy who uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a uh, he's written some really good books. One's called Teach Like a Champion. His name is Doug Lemov, um, but he he did another book called uh, Practice Perfect, and and he makes the point in there, which is you know, as a teacher, I've, I've known anyway, but from from uh, it's just that the way that he he presents it from almost a scientific point of view is that that there is the the time to actually learn something, to perfect something, if you like, uh, it, it, it's it's the, the the loop, the feedback loop that matters, and that's why when we're in the presence of a teacher, the teacher gives us an immediate feedback loop. And they say, you know, not quite right. You need to do this. You need to do that. They they kind of shift and adjust you, and that's why there's there's no better experience than a teacher. We are the most you know, kind of powerful computer, if you like, in terms of assessing someone's musical playing in the moment. But when you when you can take that, it, you know, with the, the the software that you're talking about here, and and the student can play into it and then get the feedback. That's really the next best thing, and that's something that feedback loop, rather than sort of doing it all week wrong and then going to the teacher and saying, no, nah, it's not quite right. If they're at home getting that feedback loop every day, they're going to progress faster. Um, so, I mean, we really want to make it accessible because I mean, it's just free for teachers. I mean, teachers can use the app for free, and that's what we wanted to make sure that that was something that they didn't, have, you know, it was not a barrier for them using it, you know, with their students. And it, and, and you know, teachers use it for different reasons, but it's, uh, you know, it's it's a free app. Uh, the app basically just came out about a month ago, so it's, uh, you know, we're just getting it out there. Fantastic. So. From the point of view of, say, a G4 guitar teacher, could they, could we put in the, the our content and then that could be used to be assessed? Yes. Brilliant. Yes. Okay. It, basically, how it works is, we, uh, if, if you're familiar with MuseScore at all, the uh, I, I, I know of it. Yeah, I haven't used it, but yeah. I know of it. Yeah. It's got a great export uh, you know, program. And, you know, it, if you export XML and Finale, Sibelius, sometimes you the chord uh, symbols will be like down in the where the staff is and all this. So uh, MuseScore is great, it's free, but I mean, we, we've been using that a lot. Everything that I put in there uh, uploads directly to our system is in place. And the, the teacher, a teacher can actually sit and uh, play uh, the, the audio example uh, of whatever is written to match the note, you know, notes or, or chords with the, the real audio or they have the option of as well, uh, just using synthetic audio, which is like, you know, you don't, it's like a MIDI sound, but if you even want to get better at that, you upload an MP3 and it attaches it. So you can put up your own chart and then you can sit with GarageBand or something like that and say, I'm going to upload that and it immediately attaches to it. So now, now you've got your teaching material with killer audio uh, of, of, and you playing uh, to get it across as opposed to, you know, before as a book, you know, your teacher, the, the feel of it's something that, you know, you had to kind of, you left the teacher and then you had a week at home by yourself trying to figure, you know, you, the whole listening part of it too is so, you know, essential to it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Because it really the way that I see it is that it's going to give those teachers who take it on board a real advantage because again, it, it creates that, uh, you know, from whenever you're, this is purely from a business point of view, when you're in business, you're looking for every advantage you can get. So if there's some software that you can grab and, and use ahead of the competition, it's like anything, you know, I've been into Facebook advertising, Google Google AdWords and all, and, and I did, I've done very well with those because I got in early on them. And, and I think the same applies with any good software, any good platform, uh, you know, anyone who's, any guitar teachers or music teachers that are listening to this, uh, my recommendation is to get onto this early because then they're gonna, they, you know, when students see it and they're making the progress and getting the results, they're going to be telling other people and, and uh, you know, the simple thing, does your teacher use this software? No, I've never heard of it. You've got to check out this. And so it really can give you a, a you know, a, 
a first mover advantage, as they call it. So. I had an epiphany on Saturday. I was teaching this student that was a transfer student from somebody. I said, okay, I'll, I'll teach. Uh, so let's start my extra. I've taught her for maybe three weeks trying to find out what where she came from and all the, uh, you know, she did have some issues and some problems with, with some of the things that she was learning. So I gave her an option. I said, okay, we can work out of this book. I'm not going to name anything because I love the book and I've used it a lot. And it had a, like this CD that goes along with it where they can play, uh, you know, their, maybe it's one of those books, you know, first string, second string, you know, you learn the notes. And, and uh, so uh, I, I gave her the option. I said, I, th I thought she would take it. I said, here's one for the rock band. And, blah, blah. and then I, then I brought up, you know, the, the cheap music I got into one of the books, I don't know if it was an Alfred one rock guitar or something like that. And uh, I asked her afterwards, okay, well, you know, which one did you, she goes, I'd rather points to the iPad. I'd rather do that. I mean, pe kids are going that way. I mean, it's what they learn in school. I mean, they don't use paper and pencil anymore. I mean, they're communicating that way. So we just have to really think about it. I mean, if we're going to move in that direction, if we're going to keep business and keep teaching, we've got to, you know, Teachers that have been teaching this old style method, which I believe me, I, I love, I write everything out in my charts, all my songs, everything I do for rehearsals, anything by hand. I never sit and, and put it into a system. Now yeah. I'm doing it because I like doing it, but I mean, I, I don't do that. And there's a lot of people that are into that way of teaching and they're excellent teachers. And believe me, it, I don't want to step on them and say, hey, you should try this. But, you know, eventually that student is going to, you know, that, there's going to be a disconnect. You know. Yeah, you, you, you've got to you've got to follow the market. You know, it, it, you're not going to it, you know just look at the music business. Uh, you're not going to have a, a hit song by writing a song that should have been a hit in 1970. Um, you know, today we we live in a different world. People want different things. Um, the kids definitely want different things. And I know exactly what you're talking about. My daughter, she's eight years old. She's learning guitar. I can put the book in front of her and read it and she's uh, boring, boring. Um, stick it on a screen. Same thing. <laughs> she wants, she loves it. She thinks it's a game. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. But. There's uh, what they've played by just touching a little, uh, these notes. It's like a pair of eighth notes. After they've recorded, they can touch it. They can listen to them play and then then wow it's supposed to to sound they can slow all that stuff down you remember i don't know uh i used to have a Marantz cassette deck is after the 16 turntable that's how i would slow i things. had a Marantz as well yeah the gold i had the gold I mean, the old licks and all that stuff you know so yeah. i don't think frank gumball i don't think there's anything that would slow that down enough <laughs> no <laughs> but, uh, but this, we have that you know the tempo thing on on this you know so the way I've been using it too is more like a like a creation station for me that I can use because I can actually you know put up progressions I can do things and then I know the students can slow them down I know they want they can practice them at a slow speed and tell them to speed them up and you can set goals you can make them at, do it as a sight reading exercise and memorization or however you want them to practice whatever you send them you have that flexibility to do that and uh, which is which is which is very cool you know so. so where where do they go to find that? Is is it achievemusic.com or something of that nature? Yeah, it's www.achievemusic.com. You can sign up as a teacher for free, and uh, that gives you all access to everything that's on there, anytime, 24 hours a day. Uh, you can uh, then go to the App Store and download the app from uh, you know the App Store or from Google Play, depending on what device you use. Now, very soon. That first step, like probably then the next week with the next update, you're not going to have to go to the site. But I would suggest everybody go to the site because there's demos and things on there anyway. But just go check it out and um, and just remember what you see on there. And you know, in the demos, it's not going to be exactly when, when you get the original book and have the uh, capability of assigning and making comments and signing specific uh, you know ways of uh, practicing things. And you send that off to your student, and you can tell when they pick it up. And what time they practiced on it and whatever i mean you feel a lot more control and how you know being control how, how you need to help them you know yeah so yeah definitely go to the website check it out uh, it's free uh we don't charge teachers again for anything and it's going to be a great community and i would get on it get in on it now because we will have a lot of uh artists coming on soon too and they make it a teacher community as well so they'll want to get on to see what you know, so and so put in their folder to, to help them, you know, learn new things. Because, yeah. you know, I guess I know you agree that teachers have to keep evolving themselves. Of course, 
I'd still transcribe things and, and listening, uh, you know, and try to work out stuff every, you know, every day, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's not a replacement. Yeah. It's, it, it, we're not, and I know you're not suggesting that, hey, this is everything. Forget everything no. you've ever known and just go no. to this, this program. Um, no, no, it's, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's not. An uh, you know, I, was, I will say that, but it's a, the incredible learning. So there's lots of other incredible learning tools out there. The thing about this is it's, uh, it's you know, polyphonic, and that's the breakthrough the, in the technology because, you know, there's others uh, out there in the school systems that have, uh, that it's, it's monophonic. So now all the guitar players and keyboard players, you know, can't have this assessment technology. Yeah, yeah. And and so the way that I see this, and you know, to put it, the bigger picture is these are what we, we call disruptive technologies. And you, you, if you don't embrace these disruptive technologies, you become disrupted. Um, you're the one who gets hurt. And right. and so look at it, in, you can look at it everywhere. You look at it in the media, um, you know, all, all the, the media companies, the TV stations who are, who are struggling to get enough revenue now, who are putting people off or shutting down divisions um, yeah. because of the internet, uh, the internet being a disruptive uh, technology. Then you, if you look at, you know, taxi services around the world now who are screaming out over Uber, um, Uber's a, a disruptive technology. Um, you know, Airbnb, the, the next will be the banks with, with cryptocurrencies. <laughs> um, it, 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 you know, everybody, this is, this is the internet, this is the digital age. And, and so if you don't embrace it, I, I go back to, and I've mentioned this before, but, it, but it's worth mentioning again. I go back to when I was uh, a teenager learning drums and the first drum machines came out. You, you probably drum. remember that, right? I did too. I started as a drummer. Really. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think most good guitarists do, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but do, do you remember the the kind of like those little Tascam things, the little drum machines? Do you remember those? Yeah. Of course. Yep. So, but, and 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 I said to my teacher, you know, is should I quit drums now? I'd only been learning six months, and I said, should I quit because the drum machine is going to replace it? All the drummers, right? And he laughed and he said, he said, no, no, no. He said. He said they just they're just going to make it better for us, you know. They just add more to it, more ideas. We can experiment. We, there's so many good things about. It. He said, "Don't don't be afraid of technology." And I always remember that. Um, that was my teacher, Merv Dick, who um, is still a very well renowned Australian drummer. Um, but but no, yeah, I, I think embracing technology. Um, it's good. Otherwise, you're going to get bulldozed by it anyway. So um, you know, you got a choice there. Well, you see, you see that with your your elders, with you know, your I see with with my wife's family. You know, the technology is not easy when you get older, unless you you got to keep up with it. You know, and I don't want to be those one of those people that are like you know that have no clue what's going on. <laughs> how to turn on the oven or something like and it's going to get that complicated soon. You know, so you got to yeah. keep up. You're still printing vinyl records or, or Philips cassette tapes and trying to sell them, and people are going, "What are they? You know, what do oh. I do with them?" Yeah, exactly. yeah, you've got you've got to keep up, and 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 I think that that yeah, checking out especially not just even your you know what you're promoting with the cheap music, but look right across the board at the different technologies and the apps and different things that are coming out. There's so many good tools uh, for music yeah. teachers now. So yeah, interact the band uh, interaction online. I mean, there's some good programs. I don't know how the latency issue is there, but I mean, one thing that you know the whole performance aspect. I know we're talking teaching and. Uh, which is so 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 important, you know, is getting students out to perform in, in different situations. Uh, I, I've got a couple of students now, especially one girl that uh, she she goes to every open mic night that there is. She goes to uh, she does a little school. It's kind of a rock thing that they do every three months. I know that she does. She's always in those bands. So they, you know, to get them involved in that in everything that they possibly can because that what, what's missing is that. Uh, you know, the connection between people when you get just so into technology, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you yes. got to be, uh, you know, you got to know how to interact with people. It's not, that's not to take that away. You know I mean? That's great for learning, but you still have to get out there and, and play with other people and, and uh, talk with other people. Don't just sit in the back seat looking at your iPhone, you know, that kind of thing. I, sound, I know I sound like I'm 75 and I'm getting close to that. But. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And, and with, with music, I think, that there's nothing like being in the room with a with a group of musicians and the energy that comes from that. It's still, you know, we used to, you know, I should do more of it these days. I, I don't, but um, you know, when I, especially in, in, I remember those teenage years. Any moment that we could get, any any night that we could could, 
you know, get together uh, weekends. That was what we were doing, getting together and jamming, and it was just the best, absolutely the best thing to do. Um, yeah, can't replace that. I, I te technology will never replace that. That's one thing I'm, I'm quite confident no, about. You know, I, I do, about being older, I do, I can say that, hey, I came up when all the cool music was was happening. <laughs> yes. Well, it was a, it was a, I think a lot of things came together is what they call the convergence of technologies, right? Um, with the electric guitar, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, uh, you know, the ability to, to communicate, to even, even that, you know, the ability to communicate with other people uh, and, and get together, have jams and do all that sort of stuff. You, you imagine what it would have been like in the old, you know, 50 years prior to, you know, our heyday, it would have been a lot harder, you know, getting around with instruments and getting together, you know, especially outside of your village or town, it would have been difficult. So, yeah, we, we came through a good period. A very good period. Um, so I, I'm just about to wrap up, but just one more question. Um, sure. Are there any books, websites, blogs, or, or anything that you would recommend for guitar teachers to check out? Could for be guitar to do with business or teaching or anything. Uh, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, it's old school, but I mean, for um, depending on the levels of students, I mean, there, there's lots, there's lots of them out there. The ones that I have seen that I really like, oh gosh, let me think, is a uh, some of the FJH stuff uh, that for the for the young kids for the fe like the festivals and things that we have. Uh, there are uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones. To be honest with you, I. I started working on a book years ago and I, I, I finally got it out for Camp Jam that I've used a lot in my teaching. So currently knowing everything that's out there, I don't, but uh, you know, I'm back to old school to the Mel Bay and stuff, but any, any of the new stuff that uh, that's out there by uh, you know, some, some of the players that uh, are out there doing it every day, there was one that I used a lot. Uh, David Klo is the guy and it's a uh, Willis music and it's called you're in the band. That's a good, that's the beginning teacher. I think uh, I always send uh, all my you know, guitar students to go to uh, like guitarbackingtracks.com, you know, to make sure because the, to make them play over things and make them, you know, that kind of the free stuff. I try to keep them off of YouTube as much as possible until they can actually verify that, you know, I don't want them to come back with a fingering playing their thumb on the top two strings on the 12th fret kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, you, that's one of the things I should have spent a little bit more time to ask your question, answer your questions. But uh, that 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 I don't I don't know a lot of them because I I love books like uh, Artful Arpeggios back in the day with Don Mock came out with a lot of those on the out in Alfred now I believe you can get get those Alfred and the Charlie Parker Omni book you know is how I came up with all the jazz stuff. But uh, for method books you know anything out there that is how many. <laughs> With your, just as, as a quick question, with your students in, in terms of reading, uh, what did, did, did you use the Berkeley book or Mel Bay? Oh, yeah. What Berkeley do you? Right. I mean, the Berkeley Method 1, 2, uh, definitely. For the reading, those are fantastic. I mean, even the, the Mel Bay books, they have the, uh, the, you know, when students get into 2 and 3 and they make it like an extended series, and we, we have it actually on, the, on Achieve Music, but uh, that's got some hard stuff in there. I mean, it's not like you think, you know, I mean, some things, picking in cores, some uh, Django kind of stuff. I mean, there's some stuff in there. So, Well, that's why they sold, they sold, what, 10, 20 million copies of number one, but only, you know, 50,000 of number two or something. Right, right, right. <laughs> so the Berkeley, the Berkeley series are great. Uh, the Alfred stuff and, and the National Guitar Summer Workshop stuff, That uh, those are fantastic as well. So, uh, you know, and then um, there's so much now fret light guitars you know you, there's this techno all these things that you could do uh, get guitar pro i mean guitar pro are you familiar with guitar pro yes yeah i've got guitar pro yep of course all ultimate guitar of course you got to be careful about getting something that's right or wrong you know but i mean that's a great resource for for you know i, I couldn't imagine being able to go hear the solo and actually being able to convert tab into music while you're looking at it and i mean i think that that's one of the uh, biggest uh this wows when I when I was working with Camp Jam like 2008 I saw that for the first time and it just blew my mind and we tried to do something similar with real I won't even mention the name because it was like pfft, but it was <laughs> with real instruments you know but uh, yeah yeah for sure for sure they're great, great. Another another thing have you ever 
worked with Band in the Box at all? All good, great. Uh, team. I never worked with Band in the Box. I sort of, yeah, I, I, I don't know why. Just the name or something never appealed to me. I, you know, I got in early on um, using. I, I did a, you know, when I left school, I studied audio engineering uh, in mm -hmm. Sydney at the the SAE School of Audio Engineering, and um, the guy there who was the owner of SAE, which are now kind of a very successful. Talk about you know what we talked about earlier about networking, remembering the people. Well, he, back in those days, he was still quite small, um, and I think they even have you know an SAE in in LA and in different yeah, places. Atlanta as well. Okay, yeah. So um, and Gus was his name, um, and he introduced uh, at that time he'd brought back from Germany the the very first. Um, it was it was called uh, Creator. Um, and then became Notator because they added the notation to it. And it, it's now Logic, which we know Apple Logic. Uh, but it went through. I saw the very first one of that, the very early stages, using it on an Atari computer, if you remember those. Um, of course. And, I'll yeah. go back for the Commodore 64. Commodore 64, yes. They were like, yeah. I, I sort of went, I, my, uh, well, my father's friend, because I was still a teenager he had a Commodore 64 um, and then when I sort of came across this creator software that's when the Atari and they had the, like the dongle you plugged into the side and um, wow. yeah and so I got into using that and then I sort of I got right into it for a while and then I had a period where I thought I don't want any more of that I just want to get back to real music um, and and so I could have left it and then I came back to it and and so yeah I kind of stuck with with the logic platform if you like um, yeah, and never sort of yeah, ventured into band in a box or anything like that so yeah, the yeah. it's great guy. stuff though great stuff Love it. Um, Steve uh, thank you enormously for your time I know I know obviously you're very busy with everything you're doing and to, to to give up, you know, an hour of your time to to share with my audience. Uh, I know that they're going to be absolutely grateful. I'm very, very grateful for your time, and um, I'd love to do this again sometime. So maybe in you know, and I'll do my more research on the books that I use. But hey, if they do, there is one the guitar uh, one that called uh, Rock Solid Guitar. That's a good one. That actually, I, I did that one. But there are any of the Musicians Institute books are awesome as well. That I so I'm just trying I, to. I haven't I haven't checked them out. I want to check them out. Yeah, the MI books because they're supposed to be very good. Great, great instructors. Great to the point, and you can they're fantastic stuff. So, yeah, excellent, excellent. I want to say what you're doing too is amazing. I've did 50 schools and all this that you've got going on on your plate, and and I really want to recommend that to uh, you know some people that I know here uh, as far as the program goes because uh, it, it's amazing, and I, I appreciate it because I mean with you bringing the, the these new beginners uh, and adults into the teaching world, everybody benefits by it and uh, keeping music alive. And uh, hey, you're a pioneer, and I appreciate it, man. We, really do. we, we love what we do, Steve. Uh, I guess that's why we do what we love what we do. Well, what else would we be doing? Seriously. Yeah. No, I don't even want to think about that because I, I really don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a scary question. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, thanks again. Um, just hang on the line there. I'm just going to uh, end the broadcast here. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And, um, yeah, I'll be back next week with, a, with another one of these. So I'll talk to you in one sec, Steve.